Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the 2024 Cal Annual Lecture. I would like to begin by acknowledging the first Australians on whose la traditional lands we are meeting today, the Ngambri and Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to elders past and present. On behalf of the ANU Centre for Asian Australian Leadership, or more affectionately known as CAL, and the ANU, thank you for taking the time to join us this evening. We're truly delighted to have you here for what is our first inaugural lecture. For those that I have not had the opportunity to meet, my name is Geraldine Chin Moody, and I am the chair of the CAL Advisory Board. I acknowledge the presence of Foreign Minister, Senator the Honourable Penny Wong, my fellow CAL Advisory Board members, Professor Rebecca Brown, Professor Bina da Costa, Professor the Honourable Gareth Evans, Sung Lee, Professor Vin Lu, Sid Meyer, Her Excellency Harinda Sidhu, Ki Wong and Jason Yip here with us tonight. To the many ambassadors and high commissioners, representatives of the Diplomatic Corps of Australia, the Federal Minister for Reid, Sally Situ, ANU students, staff and the broader community, a warm welcome to you all. I also would like to warmly acknowledge our donors, supporters, champions, allies and advocates who are here tonight. Welcome and thank you very much for your continued support and confidence over the years. Tonight, I join you here in Llewellyn Hall as a proud second generation alumna of ANU. My father, a third generation Australian born Chinese from Darwin, dreamed of studying Chinese language, literature, history and philosophy at ANU. He arrived at ANU in 1970 to study under an ANU National Asian Studies Scholarship. He is here tonight and he is thrilled to be in the presence of his two favourite foreign ministers. <laughs> Since the 1940s, ANU has been a national leader in Asian studies and research, so it is only fitting that ANU is the home for the Centre for Asian Australian Leadership. Established by the ANU in January 2020, CAL has become a national hub of ideas and initiatives in advancing Asian Australian representation and cultural diversity leadership in Australia. CAL is the first of its kind in Australia, the very first national centre dedicated to tackling the bamboo ceiling and addressing the leadership gap facing Asian Australians. Our mission, purpose and vision at CAL are clear. We want to see leadership in Australia be more inclusive, authentic and representative and ensure that being Asian Australian is no longer a barrier to holding a senior leadership position. Through evidence-based academic research, and effective advocacy, we want to break the bamboo ceiling through the removal of the systemic and institutional barriers that presently exist. We can only achieve this collaboratively, and I'm delighted to see so many senior and emerging Asian Australian leaders and allies in this hall tonight. Tonight is a very special gathering. The Carl Annual Lecture aims to host and feature each year an influential Asian Australian leader to present a topic of importance to Australia's national interest. As this is the inaugural lecture, it is only fitting that we have our first Minister of Asian Australian Heritage to serve in an Australian Cabinet, the first openly gay Australian Federal Parliamentarian, and now the longest serving female Cabinet Minister in the history of the Australian Parliament as our very first keynote speaker. Minister, <laughs> thank you. Minister Wong's many firsts and her collective achievements and accomplishments give Asian Australians and others from traditionally marginalised backgrounds hope that when it comes to leadership aspirations, the sky is limitless. I would also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the incredible leadership of the former chair of our advisory board, former chancellor of the ANU and former foreign minister of Australia, Professor Gareth Evans. Gareth, the Centre's journey to address the leadership gap facing Asian Australians started with your influential speech, Asian Australians Breaking the Bamboo Ceiling, delivered at Asia Link's 2019 Sir Edward Weary Dunlop Lecture. Throughout your career, you have argued and advocated for a genuinely multicultural Australia, and one which reflects in particular the reality of our Asian geography. 
In that speech in 2019 on Asian Australian leadership, you presented on the reality of our ethnic and cultural diversity, the value of such diversity, why Asian Australians are underrepresented, and the strategies for breakthrough. This framework still guides us in making our case for change and gives clarity to the centre's mission and purpose. On behalf of Cal and everyone here tonight, I would like to sincerely thank you, Gareth, and welcome you to the stage to provide some opening remarks and introduce our very special guest speaker. Well, thanks, Geraldine, for that very generous introduction. I don't think I'm alone. Indeed, I believe I speak for millions, the great majority of Australians, when I say I feel a real surge of pride whenever I see in the media pictures and stories of Penny Wong acting as Australia's face and voice to the world. She, Penny, represents everything that most of us at least like to believe about ourselves and the country that we've become. That we're a genuinely, vibrantly multicultural society that for so long, which has completely thrown off that awful racial prejudice which for so long defined us in the eyes of the region and the wider world. A country that joyously celebrates its diversity. We in the ANU, again, could not feel prouder or more privileged than to have the honour of welcoming this great Asian Australian to our stage tonight. Penny has won the nation's respect and affection because she so obviously has the kind of integrity values, intellectual capacity, personal presence, and passionate commitment to this country that make her a wonderful leader and role model. But the reality we're grappling still in this country is there are still far too few Asian Australians of comparable quality actually occupying comparable leadership positions whether it be in politics, the public service, the professions, leading educational institutions, or our major listed companies. As I did note back in 2019, delivering that lecture that Geraldine referred to, Australians of Asian heritage constituted on the then available evidence, and I know that the figure has significantly increased since then, some 12% of our population but they made up just 1.6% of federal government ministers, heads of federal and state government departments, university vice chancellors, and CEOs of the ASX 200 companies. And even when the tape measure was dropped down to shoulder level in all these institutions, counting not just leaders, but their deputies, not just ministers, for example, but members of parliament, the proportion of Asian Australians was then still only just over 3%. So there did indeed seem to be some bamboo ceiling in place. Although the numbers of those engaged in positions has also no doubt increased a bit since 2019, the reality is that's still the case. So we had to ask ourselves why it was that we as a nation were not making the most of the vast store of talent that existed in the multiple Asian Australian communities that make up such a large proportion of our overall national community. And we had to ask ourselves what more we could do to ensure that the great many Asian Australians that we know have the kind of qualities that I've described in Penny Wong, which would make them great leaders of our major public and private sector institutions, where they actually given the chance to play those roles, were given that chance. And so it was, as you've heard, that to answer these questions at the ANU Centre for Asian Australian Leadership was born in 2020. And since its inception, the centre has been working hard to do just that, to answer those questions, as you'll be hearing from Geraldine Chin Moody in a little more detail before we finally conclude this event. With a well-constructed strategic plan that closely aligns with the ANU's own, the centre is in a strong position, I believe, to take forward a number of new and continuing research, advocacy, training, and outreach initiatives over the period ahead. And I'm confident that over time, it really will make a difference. I want to take this opportunity to pay tribute to the indispensable role played in all of this by the centre's founding director, and for most of its existence, its only employee, Jay Yung Lo, sitting down there at the end of the stage. Jay Yung first joined me back in 2016 when I was ANU Chancellor as my executive officer and manager of the then, now sadly abolished, Melbourne ANU office. 
With a background in local government and as a freelance consultant, he negotiated, for example, the sister city relationship between Hobart and Xi'an. He was a tower of strength to me, endlessly supportive, energetic and creative. It was actually Jay Jung who suggested that I make that bamboo ceiling issue the subject of my Dunlop lecture in 2019, which did trigger the ANU's agreement to create the centre, and he was the logical choice to become its first full-time leader. So now, more than four years later, Jay Jung's indicated that he wishes to pass on the baton at Carl and try his hand as a start-up founder. You can take the boy out of China, but it's very hard to take that Chinese entrepreneurial instinct out of the boy. So I really want to warmly thank him and ask you to join me in thanking him for everything he's done and wish him the success he deserves in the future. Just a couple of other thank yous. The centre was very strongly supported in its first years, not least financially, by former Vice-Chancellor Brian Schmidt and his excellent office team, led by Chris Price and Lily Matthews, both here with us tonight. And that's continued under his successor, Genevieve Bell, and her new provost, also delightfully with us here tonight, Professor Rebecca Brown, to whom we're delighted the Senate will now be reporting. I also want to acknowledge the tremendously supportive role played by the Centre's advisory board, which I had the honour of chairing, as you've heard, until the wonderful Geraldine Chin Moody succeeded me last year, nearly all of whom are also with us here this evening. Its members are a great combination of private, academic and public sector professionals, very, very generous with their time, with their expertise and their resources, and they've, that they've been prepared to devote to the Centre, and they're totally committed to its mission. So thank you to all of those. Carl's greatest supporter in high places has been, from the outset, our inaugural annual lecturer this evening, Senator Penny Wong. Speaking to the first Asian Australian Leadership Summit in 2019, which shaped the agenda for the soon to be established new centre, I remember her talking eloquently, as she no doubt will again this evening, of the responsibility of role models. You can't be what you can't see and other advocates for decency if the bamboo ceiling and other cultural barriers like it was really to become a thing of the past. Each time, I remember her saying then, each time a public figure or someone in a senior position champions the rights of those who are marginalised, they give courage to others to do the same. If you're given a platform, use it to help inspire those of different identities and backgrounds to reach their potential. Since becoming our Foreign Minister in 2022, Penny Wong has done a fantastic job on multiple fronts. Now, neither she nor I would claim to agree about absolutely everything. How could I when I'm a cantankerous geriatric long past his use-by date? <laughs> and Penny is the face and voice of Australia's future. But I yield to no one in my admiration for what she's achieved in re-establishing sanity and balance in our relations with China, in recreating mutual respect in relations with our other key neighbours in the Indo-Pacific, in Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia and the Pacific Islands, in giving all Australians a new sense of belief in ourselves as a genuinely decent country in which your ethnicity, race, religion, gender, sexual identity or anything else that makes you what you are as distinct from what you do irrelevant to how society treats you. And above all, for giving Asian Australians our fantastic but still under-recognised and underutilised national resource and incredible role model. So again, let me say we couldn't be prouder or more privileged, more honoured to have our Foreign Minister, Senator the Honourable Penny Wong, deliver at ANU this inaugural annual lecture of Australian, Asian Australian leadership and I have enormous pleasure now in inviting Penny to the lectern. Thank you very much, Gareth. That was a very generous introduction and I'll come, I'll come to you shortly. <laughs> Um, but I first want to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples of the Canberra region, and I want to pay my respects to elders past and present, uh, and to acknowledge the ongo ongoing custodianship of and relationship with country. 
Uh, I acknowledge also that there, there are a lot of um, very distinguished people, so I apologise if I don't get to you all, but if I can make special acknowledgement of, of Rebecca Brown, the Provost and Senior Vice President, to Geraldine uh, and her family. Um, it was lovely, uh, and all the members of the board here this evening, it was lovely to meet with some of you before, and can I say it was, I was particularly touched to meet your father, who knew my father briefly at university, so that was a, a nice part of history. Uh, can I acknowledge also Jia Jung, thank you for the work you've done for so many years. Uh, members of the Diplomatic Corps, uh, members of Parliament who are here, uh, but I think, I'm not sure if Sally, is Sally Situ here? She was going to come shortly. Uh, distinguished guests and friends, I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, that we have a centre for Australian, Asian Australian leadership is a source of of great um, national pride for me. Uh, and it is the first centre of its kind. It's dedicated to uh, addressing the underrepresentation of Asian Australians in leadership positions, and it is a singular honour for me to be invited to give this inaugural lecture, and I thank you. Well, we are here tonight to talk about Asian Australians, about the leadership role we play, about the change we seek, and the contribution we make to securing a better place for Australia in the world. So if I can just make a point. Yeah. You know, I, I, Why do you care about So you've spoken. Can I speak now? Uh, you've spoken. Uh, I would I would say two things first. Uh, you know, we are a democracy, and everyone vo everyone's voice matters. And I would, I'm very deeply respectful of and understand the pain and trauma and the depth of feeling this issue generates. I would say we don't gain anything by shouting each other down. Apologies, but we're just going to take a brief pause. ANU has a long history of student activism and our campus is a place of academic freedom and our community have a right to freely express themselves, provided it is done in a respectful manner. The audience is here today to listen to our guest speaker and our audience has a right to hear and enjoy the lecture. The university is happy to hear your views in a more appropriate forum, but I will ask that you either sit down so we can continue or please exit the hall by the doors at the top of the stairs. Well, whoever you are right at this moment, I love you too. <laughs> As I was saying, I do, I, I'm very grateful to be here to give this inaugural lecture. Uh, and of course, we are here to, uh, tonight to talk not so much 
or maybe a little about me, but about the leadership role Asian Australians play, the change we seek, and the contribution we make to securing a better place for Australia in the world. I also want to address some related matters, including the perennial task of improving Asia capability in Australia, which I feel like I've been speaking about for 20 years, with very little success. I've also been asked to speak about my personal experience. As you may or may not know, this is not my favourite topic, but for you I will make some exceptions. <laughs> but before I get to this point, I want to speak a little about uh, one Australian who has been really at the forefront of connecting Australia with Asia uh, and advancing Australia's interests in Asia uh, and someone who was uh, a role model to me uh, as, a, as a young Labor person and that person is Gareth Evans. Gareth is the longest serving Labor Foreign Minister but true to the standard of being a Labor Foreign Minister, he never merely served. He never simply occupied the office. He drove one of the most active foreign policy agendas this country has ever seen. He carried forward the Labor tradition of innovating and reimagining Australia's foreign policy of alliance, region and the rules for the times. And most notably of all, he did this by deepening our influence in Southeast Asia and working in the multilateral system to strengthen the international rules-based order. order. Gareth's work on disarmament and weapons non-proliferation was prolific. Take chemical weapons, for example. Negotiations for a treaty to ban the production and use of chemical weapons have been dragging for seven years when Gareth corralled foreign ministers, and I know what that feels like to be corralled by Gareth Evans, into a political breakthrough, leveraging Australia's status as a constructive middle power. The Chemical Weapons Convention remains one of Australia's greatest multilateral achievements. And Gareth's activism in Southeast Asia transformed the way Australia was seen in the region, most of all through the dogged creative diplomacy, often alongside Indonesia, that led to the Paris Peace Agreements on Cambodia. Alan Gingell described it as Australia's most significant contribution to solving a regional problem since Indonesian independence. So I can tell you that our role Australia's role under Gareth in overcoming years of local tragedy and regional instability, our support for the UN Transitional Authority in Cambodia, all of these things and more are still spoken of in the highest terms by the Cambodian government and people uh, across our region and the world. These two case studies tell us a lot about Gareth. He never brought into, uh, into assumptions, he never bought into assumptions about Australian, Australia's limits. He never accepted any inherent constraint on the potential for our influence in our region and around the world. He always pushed the boundaries of what was possible for Australian diplomacy. He always looked to shape the times rather than simply be shaped by them. The world saw terrible conflicts and atrocities in those years, but the times were also defined by the end of the Cold War and the opportunity and realignment that followed. Today's world is defined by altogether less optimistic trends and dynamics. The confluence of great power competition, multiple devastating conflicts, rising authoritarianism, worsening climate change and the growing intersection of security and economics. That's another speech, so I won't be speaking about all of those dynamics, although I did discuss them in detail at a recent ANU forum at the National Security College conference. But these circumstances that we mean that to assure Australia's position, we need at least as much ambition as was marshalled by Gareth Evans and his colleagues. These circumstances mean we need all arms of national power, all tools of statecraft deployed to advance our national interests. And we have to be smarter about how we advance our interests. And those interests, of course, lie in peace, stability and prosperity. We have to be more strategic. We have to be more strategic in how we ensure our region enjoys a balance where small and medium countries aren't dominated by major powers and where we can all decide our own destinies. Australia, put simply, has to be more effective and more capable in our region. Which brings me to all of you and to the Centre for Australian, Asian Australian Leadership. Asian Australians, particularly those of my generation and earlier, will be all too familiar with the narrative of immigrant as burden, of immigrant as peril, 
a drain on resources, a threat to cohesion. We saw it from Mr Howard in the 1980s when he called for a reduction in Asian immigration and I will never forget that or the toll it took on my family. And we do see it from Mr Dutton again today. What I would say to you is we all know where these words land. We know what communities hear. We know what divisive rhetoric does and what it is, who it is heard by. I've said many times that politicians have a responsibility to take care with their words, to not just seize a political opportunity, but consider the implications of what they say and what they do. I believe fear-mongering is damaging to our community, but I also believe it is a lost opportunity for our country, an opportunity, the opportunity of being more unified to avoid reproducing conflicts here. As Foreign Minister, I've been looking to tell a different story to Australia and the world. The world is big, it is complex, and it is interconnected. We cannot deliver Australia's interests purely by purely engaging among or through traditional partners. We have to invest in our own deep, and direct relationships throughout our region and beyond. Like any engagement, it is more effective if we meet countries where they are, to build alignment between who we are and what we want. And we have a huge advantage in that task, quite simply because of who we are, a modern, multicultural nation, home to the oldest continuing civilization in the world. More than 300 ancestries reflecting every corner of our world. Half of us born overseas or with a parent born overseas, including me and including so many of you. Over a million Australians who claim ancestry from Southeast Asia. 1.4 million Australians who claim ancestry from South Asia. 1.6 who claim ancestry from North Asia. You know, I've been to more than a few countries I can't think of any other country that matches our inherent ability to find common ground with the world's peoples. But of course our challenge is to take this ability and make it central to how we engage with the world. Now this isn't a radical or a particularly new concept, concept that our diaspora populations support our ties with other countries. But the relative importance of this for Australia is so much greater, as is the extent to which it is a national asset, because of the world in which we live and because of the region in which we live. So whilst I don't often speak about myself, I am going to draw on my own experiences to illustrate the point. It would have been unimaginable to me when I first came to this country that I would one day be Australia's foreign minister or government leader in the Senate. I think Michael and I actually shared this conversation before, just before I spoke. Such an idea would have been as fantastic as fiction. And nothing in those early years as an Asian kid in Adelaide whose parents were married while the white Australia policy was still in place, nothing in those early years suggested this was a possibility. Experiences of prejudice and racism that will be too familiar to many of you. There are many ways people respond to those kind of experiences. Well, I chose to work for change, and seeking election was part of that choice, to fully realise my agency, to try and be in the rooms where decisions were made, to try to shape those decisions for the better, to be part of a political movement for a respectful, modern Australia, and to be part of writing a story that includes all of us. So, but making that choice was one thing, following it through has been a little harder. I remember how it felt in my early political career. I wouldn't necessarily say it was intimidating, I'm not easily intimidated. But it certainly felt daunting to so often be the first. Because what's implicit in being the first is being the only. And for a long time that was the case. 
I think in my first few years in the Senate, I shared them with uh, Sabin Chen until the Liberal Party didn't pre-select him for a second term. And there were times where I felt like the only Asian faces I'd seen in Parliament House were the cleaners and a woman who worked in the library. You know that thing where you encounter those who are different and you kind of share a knowing and unspoken acknowledgement? I suppose it was natural for me to wonder at times if I had made the right choice. But that question was always answered by my conviction that we need, need to have genuine diversity in our institutions. You would have heard me say that to represent the community, we need to reflect the community. A democratic country needs to be able to see itself and its leaders. So throughout that time of being first and only, I was determined to not remain so. And I was very conscious of the responsibility that I carried and I still carry in making space for the second and the third and many more. Not just in terms of encouraging and mentoring and urging people to um, pre-select diverse candidates, but also in, the term, in terms of the pressure not to stuff it up. I presume a few of you might relate to that pressure. You see, I always knew there were some mistakes, there were mistakes that some politicians could take in their stride, but that these weren't the kind of mistakes I could get away with. And yet the upshot of trying not to make mistakes was that at times I was criticised for being robotic or wooden or cold. And yet I suspect the same people who said that would have pounced somewhat gleefully on, on any misstep to question my competence especially while I was simultaneously leadi leading the fiendishly high stakes and complex reforms of emissions trading, a mandated renewable energy target, and in the Murray-Darling Basin. So it took some time for those judgments to mellow, because e and even the best of countries, remember, is always a work in progress. And Australia has changed dramatically over the course of my life and my career. I'm really deeply gratified by the trend we see today, including more second generation Asian Australians entering politics. The entire space has changed. Grassroots, staff, backbench, ministry. But we likewise see more representation across business, institution and communities and we have come a long way. I have now the privilege of serving in the most diverse parliament in your country's history. I have the privilege to serve in the most diverse government in your country's history. And I think of hearing the first speeches of my colleagues, Sally Situ, Sam Limbs, Anita Mascarenas, Cassandra, Fernando, Michelle, Ananda Raja, and Varun Ghosh, and I think about how long we had to wait to hear those voices. I think about serving in a government with colleagues of different faiths, Buddhist, Christian, Hindu, Jewish, Muslim with the first Muslim woman minister, and Dr. Anne Ali, and the first Muslim cabinet minister, Ehid Husek. And the hope that with them as well, we are making space for the second and the third and more. But you know, I think most of my hope comes from the younger generation, my children and their peers, their approach, their experience, so different from my own. And that gives me hope that in the not too distant future, we will see more Asian Australians become cabinet ministers and leaders. Most of all, that that will be entirely unremarkable. So at this inaugural lecture for the Centre for Asian Australian Leadership, let me assert my hope that Asian Australian leaders will be part of the landscape as leaders are from any other ethnic background. Maybe one day we won't even need a centre for Asian Australian leadership. But as Gareth has referenced so eloquently uh, a couple of years ago, a few years ago, and in his introduction, there is still so much to be done. I might usually leave this to the commentators, but given I was invited here this evening, I would note that it is beyond doubt that having an Asian Australian foreign minister does send a clear message to the region about who we are. What it does do is it renders as nonsense narratives that might be pushed by others that cast us simply as intolerant and unwelcoming. Narratives that have sometimes resonated and, calm, and can harm our interests in a contested region. 
Of course, that doesn't mean that every foreign minister from now on has to be an Asian Australian. But it does mean that if we want the world to understand who we are and what we stand for, we have to project who we are and what we stand for. We have to project that overall, in government, in business, academia and culture. It means there is power in our diasporas, in Asian Australian diasporas, because Australia needs you. We need your perspectives and insights, your cultural understanding, we need your connections, we need your language skills. Which brings me to a major challenge Australia faces. There are around 700,000 Mandarin speakers in Australia, hundreds of thousands of Cantonese speakers. These are impressive numbers, but there's a cautionary footnote. The number of those Man of Mandarin speaking Australians who don't have uh, a Chinese heritage would be in the low hundreds. The number of university students studying an Asian language fell 30% in Australia in the decade to 2022. I hate that statistic. The decline in Indonesian language study is particularly concerning. Fewer people studying Indonesian in Australia than there were under Whitlam, despite our population having doubled. In Australian high schools, twice as many students study German in year 12 as Indonesian and five times as many students study French. Well, while successive Labor governments have acknowledged this reality and sought to change it, change it, it's not a priority that's been consistently shared by the Liberal National Parties, which in part explains the lack of steady progress over time. But we know that our interests demand we engage in the region more consistently and more deeply. And language is part of that. Building of the work of Building on the work of Labor government's initiatives, such as uh, Prime Minister Rudd's Australia Asia Awards and Prime Minister Gillard's Asia Bound program, the new Colombo plan has helped thousands of Australian students undertake study, language training and internships in our region. A decade on from the establishment of the program, it is time to reflect on how we can ensure the program continues to build on the good work Julie Bishop did to establish the program. We want New Colombo Plan's participants to bring back not just lasting memories, but skills and capabilities to broaden our national understanding of our region. We want more students to spend more time in the region, we want more students to learn languages, and we want to ensure that short-term programs deliver real benefits for students. So tonight I'm announcing three reforms of the New Colombo Plan beginning in 2025 to ensure the program supports our strategic objectives and lifts the capability of our people. First, we will remove the cap and we will aim to double the number of long-term scholarships available to universities and introduce a stronger focus on language learning. Second, we will create a new language stream to provide an avenue for students to deepen their language skills through intensive short courses and longer term immersive programs. Third, we will retain short term mobility grants for students, but we will ensure these better utilize institutional links between universities and deliver tangible benefits for students. And we will increase the minimum duration of short term mobility courses from two to four weeks. So while these changes won't show, solve our Asia literacy challenge on their own, they are one piece of the puzzle, one step in the process and a signal to the education sector. Programs like those run by the Australian Consortium for In-Country in Indonesia Studies, SCCs, have played an important role over many decades in building Indonesia capability. We are also now with the NCP reforms, investing in growing capability in Asian languages. And I've asked one of our best thinkers in this space, the Assistant Minister for Foreign Affairs, Tim Watts, to chair an external advisory group to consult on how we ensure the next phase of the new Colombo plan is fit for purpose and builds the capability of our people. We need to increase training of teachers in Asian languages as education Minister Jason Clare is doing. We need to increase our collaboration with the university sector and industry to make Asian languages a more attractive offering for students. And we need business to join with us to better harness the capability of our graduates and our workforce. We need to demonstrate 
to graduates that these skills and capabilities are valued. All of this is just the beginning of what we need to do if Australia is to rise to the challenges in our region. We've announced about just over $100 million in projects to invest more broadly in Australia's Asia capability, including in partnership with AsiaLink, universities including ANU, the Asia Society, Australia and Indonesia Institute, the National Foundation for Australia-China Relations, the Centre for Australian-India Relations and the Australian Vietnam Policy Institute. And we have created the ASEAN Australia Centre, a new institution designed specifically to deepen Southeast Asia literacy, increase economic ties, improve educational links and expand cultural connections. But government alone cannot be the only driver of Australia's Asia engagement and Australia's capability investment. We need to see much more from the private sector. In 2022, Southeast Asia's combined nominal GDP was around $5.2 trillion, larger than the economies of the United Kingdom, France or Canada. Indonesia alone is projected to be the world's fifth largest economy by 2040. But our trade and investment with the region has not kept pace with the growth of the South Southeast Asian economies. Yeah. Uh, well, Southeast Asia has grown rapidly, when we came to government, Australian direct investment in Southeast Asia was lower than it was in 2014. So we have to turn this around, which is why we appointed Nicholas Moore AO as our special envoy to Southeast Asia and charged him with developing a Southeast Asia economic strategy to 2040. And the Albanese government has delivered a number of measures in response to the strategy, including a $2 billion investment financing facility to boost Australian investment in Southeast Asia, particularly in clean energy transition and infrastructure development. We have specialist deal teams established, are being established in Jakarta, Singapore and Ho Chi Minh City to work with investors. 10 senior Australian business champions have been appointed to ensure government and the private sector work in tandem, and we are helping more Australian businesses engage in the region through a new Southeast Asia business exchange. We have also improved visa access for business people from Southeast Asia. And we are doing all of this because we live in the most competitive region in the world. And it offers us enormous opportunity and equally large exposures if we fail to seize this. So, the government's initiatives are designed to make it easier for Australian business to get established in new markets. Smart business will take the opportunity created by the strategy. Smart business will do more business in Southeast Asia. And most relevantly tonight, smart businesses will see the advantage in Australia's Asian diasporas. Greater economic engagement with Southeast Asia and across the region helps us build alignment. It helps foster a dynamic that reassures the region of our intentions for peace and prosperity. It's one of the ways we can deter conflict. It's one of the ways we can contribute to the stability of our region. Economic engagement is one of the arms of national power that I speak so much about and that I mentioned at the outset of this speech. Our country sits between the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Our links to the world are shaped by the contours of Southeast Asia. So we are bound not just by shared geography, but ultimately by the shared destiny of our interests. What happens in and through this region will be central to Australia's future. And our ability to optimise Australia's position demands an unprecedented coordination of statecraft. And most of all, it relies on our people. It relies on maintaining our cohesion as a people, on not letting reckless politicians divide us for political gain. It relies on the contribution of all Australians, of all diasporas working together it relies on unity, not division. It relies on respect, not vilification. And it relies on all of us 
recognising each other's value and all of us knowing that the whole is greater than the sum of our parts. It is in this way we build the country we need today, but also the country we want for our children. Thank you. Well, thank you, Minister, for that outstanding address. I'm sure I speak on behalf of all of us when I say we're so pleased that you chose to work for change and that you're following that through. Um, so you've talked a little bit, oh, we've, we've had, I'd like to take this opportunity to ask you a few questions. We were, um, had a series of questions submitted to us in advance and I'm gonna go through some of those with you now. Um, so you've talked a bit about role models and the importance of those. Um, We'd love to um, hear a little bit more about who were your role models um, and what was the kind of impact and influence they had in your career? Apart from Gareth, of course. Apart, <laughs> apart from Gareth, of course. Actually, can I tell you a funny Gareth an anecdote before I get to this? Of course. So, you know, in, well, I'm uh, in opposition and I was trying to sort of do a lot of speeches and writing to get my head around what on this, you know, Labor foreign policy for the time worked at, uh, would look like. and. And Gareth, uh, you know, was always pushing me to be more ambitious or bending my ear about something. And I said at one point, Gareth, you need to understand, I am who I am. Uh, and, you know, maybe my risk appetite sometimes is not as great as yours because, you know, I'm an Asian lesbian. <laughs> to which he says, oh, but that's de rigueur now. <laughs> <laughs> I've never forgotten that. <laughs> Role models. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking about putting that into the speech and I thought there was nowhere that that really worked. So I thought I'll just do it. <laughs> um, I think I had, I mean, we all, I could give you sort of political role models. Um, I, I had, um, I had wonderful parents uh, and both of whom passed away in the last year. Um, and both of them embodied uh, many values and uh, that I respect and also the, the sorts of um, identities that we are talking about. So my, my father was uh, Malaysian Chinese, born at the, uh, in the sort of last years of, the, of World War II, um, who worked his way up and got a Colombo Plan scholarship to Australia, etc. My mother was, you know, from a far, off a farm, uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, background, uh, who was so deeply respectful of other cultures and other races at a time, you know, you know married my father while the Wallace White Australia policy was still in place. So on, on these issues, I think that having those two um, extraordinary individuals as my parents were, was, a, um, you know, they were role models for me in many ways. You know, you have your political role models, um, uh, people who you look to uh, and who you respect, um, yeah, I, I read, even though I didn't agree with everything, I read a lot of Lee Kuan Yew when I was younger. Uh, it was interesting. Um, I was a big fan of Gareth and Paul Keating. And Bob Hawke. Um, yeah, and uh, obviously, you know, women like Jenny Macklin uh, when I was in the parliament, when we were in the parliament together. So I've been very privileged through my life, I think, to have had a lot of people to look look up to. I don't know that I had someone who was, there wasn't a model of what it was to be an Asian Australian woman uh, as a cabinet minister. So I think, um, I'm about to tell another anecdote. Do you want me to stop talking? Please, no, I, I, think, talking? I think we'd all love to hear your anecdotes. I'm quite tired and so this is, you're getting Penny unplugged. <laughs> My staff are sitting down the end there and they all took an intake of breath when they said that, that <laughs> I said that. I remember one of the last legal cases I did as a lawyer. So I was pre-selected and then, um, and I had this one matter that had gone on for ages and I said, look, I'll just finish it because it's um, closing submissions and so by the time someone else takes over, it's going to be too difficult. And I, 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 I sat in that 
room and I, the instructing solicitor on the other side was a young Asian Australian and I suddenly realised I had never been in a courtroom with another Asian Australian woman other than maybe the reporter or the cleaner. And I thought, wow, I guess this is what a lot of men have all the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, better get to the next question, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, we've got um, emerging Australian, Asian Australian leaders oh. who've travelled from across the country to hear you speak tonight, which is wonderful, and thank you so much to all of you for joining us. And I know that one of the things that they're really interested in hearing about is, is how our unique um, backgrounds and multicultural backgrounds uh, become a superpower. Um, so how do we lead into our Asian heritage and really use that to do our jobs better? Um, and I wanted to ask, Minister, is that something that you've experienced? And if so, is there a time when you've put this superpower to use? No, I don't think that's superpower. I don't think, I, I've never thought about that. But I think, well, one, certainly from my background, you know, I think you know about hard work and discipline. <laughs> that's kind of inculcated. Um, but I do think what it also brings uh, is that, uh, I hope, a curiosity about, well, first an awareness that of the multiplicity of different worldviews and experiences. So perhaps that is a superpower because I, I, it is, there's a lot of bad things that are done in the world because people assume that their worldview is the objectively correct one. So I think to be, have, is it humility or an understanding that how you think and perceive the world is not um, universal. And secondly, to have a curiosity about the other. A curiosity about how does, how does he see it? How does she see it? What, what's, what, why, why, what, what, why is that important to them? Like I, I actually think that Maybe that's the superpower, isn't it? Because it certainly enables, I mean, I'm not a business person, but I, I, I'm a diplomat. And so if I sit down though with others, uh, uh, you know, what part of what you're doing as the foreign minister, you're advocating for your country, but you're also trying to understand what are the points of entry? What are the areas where we, 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 we're going to agree? Or I can, if I explain it in this way, we can, we can, we can build agreement. And that requires a curiosity about the other. That's, I think, a very good thing in a world which is increasingly divided. Thank you very much. Um, so I've got one final question, because um, we're coming um, close to time. Um, but discussions on Australia-China relations often circle back to US-China relations. Um, and so I just wanted to ask, is Australia pursuing strategic independence in its approach to China? <laughs> and, and, how, and, and how do you see Australia's distinct role in navigating China's rise in the emerging new world order? <laughs> in two minutes. It's, we, we, are, we, are, we are Australia. We are no other country. And we have a, you know, we, we have to have in how we operate in a world where the world and the region that we live in are being reshaped. We have to think very clearly about who we are, what we want, and how we, how we uh, work for those interests. Uh, you know, we are not a superpower. Uh, we, we, we care a lot about rules. Um, I, I've spoken in shorthand way of the alliance, the rules and the region. Very simplistic way of saying, yes, we have a US alliance. That is a very important part of stability in the region. We are also deeply committed uh, to the regional architecture for the reasons that, uh, inter alia that I went through, in, in part that I went through tonight. Uh, and we care about, uh, we're, as a middle power, we care about the multilateral system. We care about rules because we do not do well in a world uh, where power alone determines outcomes. So we always have to argue for multilateralism. So that is unique to who we are. Uh, and that will mean we will deal with um, uh, not just traditional partners, but non-traditional partners. It will mean that that perspective should inform our position. So you may have seen, uh, you know, for example, on the Middle East, that we have issued statements with Canada and New Zealand uh, as a, uh, you know, 
I suppose, smaller and middle powers uh, making their assertion about those issues. So, and we will, we will continue to, to chart our course. We always have to chart our course. Um, and the point I was try seeking to make tonight is I think part of charting that course uh, is who we are. Thank you very much. Um, thank, thank you. Um, thank you, Minister Wong, once again for delivering our lecture. You can't be what you can't see. So having you here to deliver this first lecture as we seek to break the bamboo ceiling and advance Asian Australian leadership in Australia is so incredibly special. So thank you very much. Since its inception, Cal has developed a solid portfolio of academic research projects, outreach initiatives, training and leadership programs under Jay Young. I echo Professor Evans' comments in warmly thanking Jay Young for his incredible leadership of Cal and wish him all the very best. As we look towards the future, Cal has a clear strategy and impact plan to scale and grow even further. And on behalf of the advisory board, we're looking forward to working closely with the provost and the ANU teams to deliver on this impact. Working with our industry partner, PwC, Cal and our research collaborator, the Centre for Social Policy Research, will soon be publicly releasing the findings of our flagship research project, measuring the effect of Asian Australian diversity on the performance of Australian companies. In collaboration with Dr Liz Allen from the ANU College of Arts and Social Sciences, we will continue to advance our second flagship research project, Counting for Change, as we work towards a nationally consistent approach to measuring ethnicity in contemporary Australia. Being a part of Australia's only national university, we really want to foster greater academic leadership within the centre to support a wider academic and evidence-based research agenda for Cal. An example is to help build on the work of Bob Brunick, David Hansel and Nunu Wynn, which showed there's an Asian penalty in promotions in the Australian public service. There is work afoot to replicate this analysis for the private sector, starting with the financial sector. We would also like to continue developing nation-leading executive education and leadership development programs, like our successful pilot of the William Arquette Leadership Program, and to meet growing needs and demands to address the gaps in effective training for emerging Asian Australian professionals seeking leadership positions. We cannot do this on our own. Um, it requires company by company, institution by institution, sector by sector, and individual by individual. If you would like to get involved and support this work, please do reach out and let us know. Finally, I would just like to thank you all for attending this evening. Could I please just ask that everyone remain seated momentarily while our esteemed guests depart and wish you a very good evening. Thank you. <laughs>